born some 130 years ago, a winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics and a key contributor to the Manhattan Project. Today's history maker is physicist Arthur Holly Compton. Born at Worcester, Ohio on September the 10th, 1892, the son of a professor of philosophy and dean of the College of Worcester, Elias. It was a highly academic family. Educated where his father was the dean, he graduated in 1913 with a Bachelor of Science, after which Compton obtained his PhD from Princeton in 1916. Also in 1916, Compton would marry Betty Charity McCloskey, a Worcester classmate and fellow graduate. They would have two sons, Arthur and John. In 1920, Compton is appointed a professor of physics and head of department at Washington University. Then, three years later, in 1923, he moved to the University of Chicago as professor of physics. And it is at Chicago that Compton would do his greatest work. The main piece of work that Compton is renowned for and the one that bears his name and for which he received the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1927 is called the Compton Effect. A question whose inconsistent answer had plagued scientists for centuries. Is light a particle or is it a wave. Back in the 17th century, one of the giants of physics, Isaac Newton, took the view that light behaved like a particle and taking the other side in this debate, thinking that light was a wave, was a Dutch mathematician, physicist and astronomer, Christian Huygens. He also had the claim to fame of inventing the pendulum clock. Come the 19th century and come another physics giant, James Clark Maxwell and his equations uniting the theories of electricity and magnetism. The first physicist ever to unify any of nature's fundamental forces. Clark Maxwell discovered that electricity and magnetism are actually, at the deepest level, the same force, the so-called electromagnetic force. In doing so, Maxwell proved that light is an electromagnetic wave and so linked electricity, magnetism and optics. This also indicated that visible light was a small part of a much larger electromagnetic spectrum. This, however, it was a classical theory and it still had gaps. For example, predicting the colour of light emitted from hot metal. It could not make that prediction correctly. Max Planck, another physics giant, proposed that when hot objects emit light, the light's energy must always be a multiple of a certain number. And here we have the beginning of the quantum revolution that changed physics dramatically and shaped the 20th century. Then comes Einstein and the paper for which he receives the Nobel Prize. Not so much for relativity, but for his earlier work on the fact that shining ultraviolet light on metal causes that metal to eject some of its electrons. This is called the photoelectric effect. Einstein said 
the effect could be explained if light behaved like a particle and if particles in light carried an amount of energy given by the light's frequency multiplied by the so-called Planck constant. Kind of sounds very familiar and similar to what Planck was saying earlier, a light emitted from a hot body. No. Now frequency is something a wave has, so Einstein is saying something kind of weird, that light is behaving both like a particle and like a wave. And it's thanks to Arthur Compton that we have popularised a word for this. And that word is photon. A particle of light is called a photon. Photons are massless and they always move, funnily enough, at the speed of light. So basically, the answer to the question, is light a wave or is light a particle, is that it's both. And its behaviour depends on what it's doing. Sometimes light is a wave and those characteristics are to the fore. And sometimes its behaviour is more particle-like. This is wave-particle duality. In 1922, Compton was working with very high energy light in the form of X-rays, observing how X-rays interacted with electrons. Compton observed that X-rays were modified by interacting with the electrons and they had lost some energy. When he examined the paths and energies of the X-rays that had interacted with electrons, the only interpretation that made sense was that the X-rays and electrons had behaved like two colliding particles. And Compton established a single X-ray interacts with a single electron. Compton's experiment provided decisive proof that Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect was correct. Light could behave like a particle. Many physicists simply refused to believe this. They could not accept that the, the X-ray energy was being modified by interactions with electrons. It's counterintuitive to everyday experience. As Compton himself said, if you whistle in front of a barn door, the echo you get back sounds just the same as the sound that goes out. It does not change wavelength like the X-rays were doing. Subsequently, in 1924, Louis de Broglie proposed that all matter has wave-like properties. And then, in 1927, it was proven that electrons can behave like waves. So here we have particles behaving like waves and waves behaving like particles and so wave particle duality was born. Compton was duly awarded the 1927 prize in physics for his discovery of the so-called Compton effect. De Broglie received the award in 1929 and the physicists behind the discovery about electrons behaving like waves won in 1937. Today in physics it is taken for granted that whether something behaves 
as a wave or it behaves like a particle is dependent on its environment, dependent on what it's actually doing and dependent on what you're actually measuring. The revolutionary nature of this thinking and Compton's contribution to it should not be underestimated. Various observations and experiments in the first two decades of the 20th century showed higher levels of radiation as you went higher in altitude, eventually leading to the conclusion that radiation of very high penetrating power enters from above into our atmosphere. In the 1920s, the term cosmic rays was coined. Compton first experimented with these cosmic rays in 1921. Compton took a sample of radium to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, a place reached by fewer cosmic rays than places with higher elevations. The radium's radioactivity did not change at all, indicating that radioactive elements were not made radioactive by cosmic rays. In the 1930s, scientists were still arguing about what cosmic rays actually were. There were two opposing schools of thought. One, cosmic rays are electrically charged particles. Two, cosmic rays are uncharged electromagnetic radiation, like X-rays, but with much higher energy. Compton organized expeditions to various locations on Earth to observe cosmic rays. With his family, he traveled some 40,000 miles making observations. The team discovered that the highest numbers of cosmic rays were observed at locations far from the Earth's magnetic equator. This proved that cosmic rays are largely made up of charged particles. While in 1932, Compton's graduate student, Luis Alvarez, built an array of Geiger counters to study cosmic rays. In 1933, Alvarez and Compton published a paper establishing that cosmic rays are positively charged particles. Compton would play a key role in the development of the first nuclear weapons. British scientists told their American colleagues that they believed an atomic bomb could be built in about three years. Early in 1941, Compton was appointed to lead a team of American scientists investigating whether this was realistic and he duly agreed with this three year time frame. In December 1941, Compton became head of the plutonium project, whose aim was to build a nuclear weapon based on the chemical element plutonium. This subsequently meant Compton was given responsibility for building the world's first nuclear reactor, which was needed to produce the plutonium for the bomb. Compton decided to build the nuclear reactor at his own university in Chicago. A year later, on the 2nd of December, 1942, the world's first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction took place under the direction of Enrico Fermi in a squash court under the stands of Stagfield, 
a University of Chicago football field. Ultimately, this led to the production of the atom bomb and its detonation in 1945. In 1945, with his atomic weapons work complete, Compton returned to Washington University. He continued working as a physics professor until 1961. Compton would die aged 69 on the 15th of March 1962 in Berkeley, California. He is buried in Worcester Cemetery in his hometown of Worcester, Ohio. Arthur Holly Compton, Nobel Prize winner and a key contributor to the Manhattan Project, is no doubt a history maker.